couple of years ago, I watched a four part series on a travel program on the River Nile. And the actress Joanna Lumley was the presenter. And she began in the Mediterranean Sea at the Nile Delta. And over the course of each of the four episodes, she moved ever closer to the furthest water source of the Nile, which she found to be 4,199 miles from the Mediterranean Sea. And how miserable and pathetic that source of the Nile River looked. It was a small spring in a muddy hole in the ground, out of which water seeped more than trickled. That little spring was 7,600 feet above sea level in the middle of a mountainous rainforest in Rwanda. It slowly trickled down the mountain through the forest, picking up moisture as it went, and three miles further on, it was a very small stream flowing into a larger river which flowed into the enormous Lake Victoria which in turn flowed out into eventually becoming the River Nile. On the programme, as she stands ankle deep in mud at that small spring, Joanna Lumley delivers a commentary reflecting on her experience of the Great Nile River and how it all springs from such humble beginnings. This is what she said, It, the Nile, has nursed civilizations. It brings life to the deserts and has seen fortunes rise and fall. It brings hope for the future. It floods every year and it never dries up. It is held sacred and holy by many different religions. I can't believe how such a huge river starts so quietly. A look at God's plan of salvation played out in the Bible and in the past 2,000 years of the church's history makes one thing crystal clear for us. God often, if not always, chooses and uses that which is small, insignificant, weak or broken to bring about enormous good and benefits for the human race. Whether it be the prophets like Jeremiah who says, Ah, Lord, look, I do not know how to speak. I am a child. Or the prophet Isaiah who protests against God's choice of him for his purposes by saying, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Or St. Peter, who begins his task reluctantly by saying to Jesus, Leave me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Over and over again, God chooses, as St. Paul states in the first letter to the Corinthians, what is foolish by human reckoning, what is weak by human reckoning, Those whom the world thinks common and contemptible are the ones God has chosen, those who are nothing at all, to show up those who are everything. And why does he act this way? Well, St. Paul himself got the reply from the Lord when he felt himself overcome by weakness. And he delivers those words of Christ to us in the second letter to the Corinthians when Christ Words are, my power is made manifest in weakness. Today we celebrate our national patron, St. Patrick, who when beginning his account of his life and mission in what we know as the Confessions of St. Patrick, he didn't begin by proclaiming how wonderful he was or how successful his mission had been in converting the pagan Irish to Christ. No, he began with the words, I, Patrick, am a sinner, one most unlearned, the least of all the faithful, and utterly despised by many. Patrick begins that account of his life's mission with a recognition that the task was well beyond his abilities and that he was far from being the best candidate to be Apostle of Ireland. But God had chosen him, 
And from the small, humble beginnings of a slave who shepherded sheep, God raised him to be the shepherd of a great flock that has grown and flourished and spread throughout the world the saving message of Christ's gospel. Jesus, in the gospel we have heard today, commissions the small, almost insignificant Church of the Apostles to go out and win the whole world over to the gospel. These unlearned, weak, cowardly men were to be the wellspring of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And as that Church moves through human history, she has brought the life-giving water of the good news to all generations in all places. She offers all who come to her a drink of the Saviour's Spirit. Now to be sure, there are times in the Church's history when those waters are muddied by the inevitable sinness of the people who carry it. But still, the Church's mission moves on through history, like the great Nile River, bringing life, in this case the life of Christ and life in Christ, to all she touches. But what humble beginnings, from a human perspective, are her source. However, seen with the eyes of faith, we see that the Church and her mission are not rooted in the earthly, but in the heavenly. Indeed, in the eternal and wise plan of God, who chooses the weak to strongly advance his desire and plan to heal, save and love the human race made in his image and likeness. Today, our world and our nation have need of new Patricks, men and women who, though perhaps full of weaknesses and lacking what the world would consider adequate qualifications, are yet filled with zeal for Christ as Patrick was. I pray on this St. Patrick's Day that the Lord would fill the hearts of at least some of you who hear me with something of the Spirit which filled St. Patrick. Look what great and abundant harvests the Lord has been able to reap because of Patrick's yes. Could Patrick ever have imagined that he would be the patron saint not only of Ireland but of Nigeria? Because his spiritual sons and daughters, Irish missionaries, would follow in his footsteps and leave kin and country to bring the gospel to those who had not heard it. On the morning after the dream he had in which Victoricus from Ireland pleaded with him to return to the land where he had been a slave and bring the gospel to the Irish people, could Patrick have even begun to imagine the fruits of his willingness to follow that godly and prophetic dream? Of course he couldn't have foreseen it. But he said his yes to the Lord's call, not because he saw how much fruit there would be, or how famous and revered he would become, but because he loved the Lord God with all his heart and strength, and he understood that even with a blunt and bent chisel, God is able to carve masterpieces. Patrick didn't have to be perfect, but he had to be faithful and diligent to the Lord's call and plan, the success and fruit well, that was the Lord's business. Patrick's mission was not as abundantly fruitful as it was because he was perfect, exceptionally talented or influential, but because he humbly relied on the Lord in all his difficulties and in all the work he undertook to bring souls to Christ. In his confessions, written as an old bishop, after many years building up the newborn church in Ireland, he writes, I know to some extent how I have not led a perfect life like other believers, but I acknowledge this to my Lord, and I do not blush in his sight. Patrick acknowledged that he was a sinner, but he had a more fundamental identity in which he was rooted. He was a child of God, 
of a merciful and loving father who loved him despite his weakness, despite his past. This is how Patrick sees himself after having encountered and benefited from the merciful love of Jesus. He writes in his confessions, I was like a stone lying deep in the mud. Then he who is powerful came and in his mercy pulled me out and lifted me up and placed me on the very top of the wall. That is why I must shout aloud in return to the Lord for such great good deeds of his here and now and forever, which the human mind cannot fathom. The great Nile has its beginning in a mud-filled deep well. And so too, the beginnings of the river of grace which flowed and continues to flow through and out from this land. It has humble beginnings in Patrick, a self-proclaimed stone in the mud whom Christ raised up to be a beacon of light and a trumpet of the saving gospel for the church. And this follows God's logic when it comes to salvation. From the beginnings of the church, they too are rooted in the earth. The dead body of Christ, lying in the tomb, was raised up from the grave, raised up in glory, and ascending into heaven, Christ sent the mighty, graceful flood of the Holy Spirit to empower the weak men and women of the church down through the centuries, so that they could do the unimaginable, the unprecedented, and the impossible. Go out to the whole world, proclaim the good news to all creation. The risen Lord called Patrick in his weakness to the task of extending the kingdom of God in his time and in this place, Ireland. He equipped it for the task with the presence and power of the Spirit. Today, he is calling you and me to the same task, and the same Spirit that was in Patrick is ready, willing, and able to be in you and in me also. Do you not hear his call, his invitation to give yourself over to the Lord, to let Jesus have a bigger part in your life. Do you hear it? You do. Then let us get busy. There is much work to be done, and St. Patrick will undoubtedly assist us from his high place in heaven. Hail glorious St. Patrick. Pray for us.